What's going on, fellow A Plusers? It's your boy Adam Perez. I'm back once again with a brand new episode review as we're set to tackle episode number five of Agatha All Along. And I believe we're at the halfway point of this show, or at least I'm assuming we are, because uh, Marvel Studios did go ahead and release a brand new mid season trailer for us as well. Um, they also went ahead and confirmed the identity of Teen, who we're certainly going to talk about in here. But that is uh, like a little bit of a secret, I thought, that even though it was kind of hinted, at in episode number five i thought that they would they would let the remainder of this season kind of play itself out before they put this big reveal out there on social media and into the air but it does make me wonder if the reveal of t who teen certainly is i wonder if they did that strategically in the sense of you know if people are not watching the show right now despite some of the great reviews uh and um, how audiences certainly feel about this show uh, i do wonder if they put that out there to maybe draw more viewers in in the sense of like, hey, remember this character? If you want to see how this maybe plays into the bigger overall MCU of things, you know, maybe check out the remainder of this season. Um, but who knows? Um, but I do know that we are headed in a great trajectory for this season so far. And when it comes to episode five, um, the only thing, the only gripe I truly have with episode five is that the fact that I think that this is maybe the shortest episode of the season. Uh, I, you know, I... I have not minded the length of episodes that Agatha has given us so far. A lot of them have been over 30 minutes, to say the least. Even though the time uh, clocks in at like 35 minutes, I think when you actually take out the credits and such, I think it might come out to like 38, uh, uh, 28 minutes or something along those lines. Um, so this episode felt very short when i was watching it it felt very short and so i was just thinking to myself like you guys could have given us maybe like five more minutes of content or whatever the case may be so especially when we have such a big reveal at the end as to who teen could potentially be you know i thought that that's something that they might want to explore a little bit more with the remainder of the episode but they clearly wanted to go ahead and leave us on that cliffhanger and hopefully have that explored uh throughout the remainder of the season so really my only gripe here was that I felt that this episode was a little bit long. Um, you know, I also feel really terrible for the character Alice. It's not a gripe that I have on the episode. I, I understand why they certainly killed her off. But for me as a viewer, I'm definitely feeling some type of way about it, considering that I really got sort of connected with her in episode number four, you know, um, learning about her mom's past, how she had personally been handling it, seeing Alice kind of come, um, come face to face and confront the curse that's kind of been placed on her family for generations and overcome it and be successful. You know, I, I had really high hopes for what Alice would eventually become by the end of this show, but to kind of see her fall into the trap of having Agatha draw her powers and sort of kill her in here um, definitely was um, a, a hard pill for me to swallow as somebody that really became a big fan of Alice in the previous episode in here. So, you know, clearly Alice coming to Agatha's defense to go ahead and save her from being possessed by her mother, um, but a fatal mistake certainly nonetheless is once that um, power absorption certainly begins, you know, Agatha clearly believes that she uh, can't stop it and uh, reluct reluctantly took another witch's powers here. And while she certainly looks like she's coming across with that perspective of um shamefulness right like she like it was an accident like she certainly didn't mean to i even love the sense of how she sort of lurks and crawls out of the trial while everybody else looks at Alice's body, you know, like that shameful, I didn't mean to do it, but I kind of wanted the power sort of thing and just kind of scurries off, if you will. And the fact that we find her later in this episode, like just standing by herself, clearly sulking over the loss of Alice, but there is sort of like a happiness that she certainly has realizing that, all right, this is the first step to getting her powers kind of back so you know agatha just at you know there are times i'm like is agatha playing a game is this truly all part of what agatha wants or does she really feel some level of remorse for you know having killed alice and having sort of um, a little bit of her abilities back so you know i do love what Hather catherine hahn is doing performance wise because it does make me uncertain about 
how Agatha truly feels about some of this stuff. If she's if she really feels some type of way about the death of Alice or she's truly trying to cover it up with some level of performance, as long as the ends sort of justify the means or as long as the means justify the ends that she winds up getting to the witch's road, there's a part of me that's like, I don't think Agatha really cares. But Catherine Hahn makes me feel like maybe Agatha does care. Um, so I just thought that was uh, pretty interesting how that was um, showcased here in this week's episode. One of the things that I also really enjoy, too, um, I love the concept of the brooms in here, right? With um, when we when we look at brooms, they have become such a staple, if you will, of what witches are. And the fact that we have a coven of witches in here, I love seeing their perspective on the concept of brooms, um, how it's very much seen more in a negative light than we as like the general public normally does, right? I think she mentions, I think it's Lilia that mentions that they've become over commercialized over the years uh, and co-opted for them to represent female uh, domestication or something like that. I believe is what she did. So I, I love the the turnaround of the, the perspective, if you will, of what brooms are and what they truly symbolize to witches, even though it seems very much like a commercialized concept that's really forced and kind of put upon them. And it's one that they clearly are trying to shake, but I'm glad that they at least highlighted the concept of witches flying brooms in here. I thought it was actually uh, quite fun to be quite frank with you. And then of course, Aubrey Plaza continues to win me over just some of the little things that she does, like when they're doing the Ouija board and they asks who's here with us. And it says death. Uh, the fact that she sort of chuckles, uh, I found pretty interesting. Um, you know, the little facial expression she makes when she's getting ready to kind of jump on board her broomstick. And she gives a fantastic sort of witch's cackle um, in here as they're plummeting sort of back to earth uh, while they were flying through the air on their brooms. So I love just the, the fantastic and perfect witch's cackle that we wind up getting from Aubrey Plaza's character here this week. But um, overall, man, really great episode, really fun one. I just think, if anything, the episode was way too short for me, to be quite frank with you. But I do want to dive into a couple of things when it comes to um, this episode. This is, in fact, the third trial. This one is actually going to be falling at the feet of Agatha's. Everybody, I don't want to say everybody's had their trial yet. I'm still waiting for Lilia's, but it seems as though Miss Hart might have had hers. Um, from the first episode, or actually, I think I think that might have been um, Jen's trial, the first trial. The second trial clearly was Alice's. This one is definitely Agatha's. I am fascinated that they had Agatha's before Lilia's. It makes me wonder what Lilia's trial is certainly going to be. I highly doubt Death has one, but maybe she certainly will. Or I should say Rio, uh, aka being played by Aubrey Plaza in here. I am curious if she's going to have uh, a trial of her own. Um, this one felt very much like a girl slumber party uh, from like the 90s. Everybody wearing their pajamas or their workout gear, just whatever they feel comfortable rocking. Um, Catherine Hahn clearly was a 90s girl, um, but I love the fact that they deal with um, a little bit of possession in here, messing around with the Ouija board. I mean, anytime me and the girlfriend watch anything supernatural or paranormal related, the moment somebody says uh, that they, they, they played with the Ouija board or they found a Ouija board, me and my girlfriend look at each other like why like like why why would you even do that and i love the little um the little line from lilia after teen goes over the ouija board rules i love how he flips it over and she says what is the what does the small print on the back say and it says three and up like really like we're promoting ouija boards for people at the young age of three years old i mean yeah, do you want to know why we open, why we've opened up all these gateways and stuff to the supernatural? Uh, it just makes it easier for them uh, to, to, to contact them. But like three and up, I thought that was pretty hilarious to certainly say the least. Um, but I think what um, was fascinating to me about Agatha's trial here is two things. One, being possessed by her mother. Um, I love. I I I really enjoy sort of the conflict between Agatha and her mom. You know, even though how, despite how we might feel about Agatha, whether she's a hero, whether she's a villain, whether they're making her out to be sort of like an anti-villain, whether you can't trust Agatha worth a damn sort of mentality. I do love that this episode humanizes her to a certain extent in the sense of really showcasing how deep 
her mom's anger and hatred for her truly goes right like agatha clearly wanting to appeal to her mom like how can you how, how after all these years do you still hate me and the fact that her mom doubles down on it in the sense of i should have killed you the moment you came out of my womb like that stung for me like despite all the evil shit that agatha uh, was probably done in her life you know, there is a level of humanity that I think Agatha experiences of just wanting to be loved and accepted by her mom, but her mom clearly thinking that Agatha is just some some level of evil that should just not have the opportunity to sort of exist. Not only does it emotionally hit me as a viewer, but you can clearly see how it impacts Agatha. And most importantly, I think the rest of her coven in a sense of understanding just like how vile her mom like truly is like even though they can't stand her um the levels in which agatha's mom takes it is maybe just even a little bit too much for them so there was like a level of humanity in here that i really am glad that they showcased for agatha um and i i would assume it's probably that same level of um feeling some type of way for agatha that pushes alice to then go and defend her from her mom. Um, so I, I just thought that was really eye-opening um, in here uh, as well. Um, also on top of that, the trial really doesn't come to an end until it's revealed that one additional person that's in the room with them from playing with the Ouija board is Nicholas Scratch, who is also the, the son of Agatha Harkness, the son that apparently Agatha gave up in order to get the dark hold. And to be able to hear her her son's pleas for help in here, um, definitely not only does the, the name of Nicholas Scratch kind of draw her from that, um, but there's a bigger revelation of, I don't want to say she's being haunted by Nicholas Scratch, but the fact that he's out there in the first place still trying to communicate with her, I find really fascinating. Um, I do wonder if we'll see who Nicholas Scratch is, if there's going to be a reuniting here. Does, Al does, does Agatha double down on having given up her son, or does the reveal of Billy Maximoff in here as teen make her now sort of want some level of connection with her children too i i find this really all fascinating to be quite frank with you and so um you know i definitely want to learn a little bit more about the relationship between agatha and what her son uh, nicholas um scratch certainly went through i got to assume at some point in this series that there's a flashback uh, another flashback right like wandavision we got a flashback of agatha and the witch's trial sort of thing um and i'm hoping we get a flashback as to the exact moment in which agatha gives up her son um, like if that's something that she's got to face at the end of the witch's road, will be rather fascinating to certainly say the least. But, um, and yeah, and then her trial also ends with the idea of the death of Alice. Some uh, terrible stuff here, if you ask me, but really the big question of the hour here is the revelation of teen, you know, teen becomes very defensive, uh, whenever anybody in the coven bites the dust, uh, we wind up getting, um, Sharon. Um, by in the dust, he felt some type of way about the coven not protecting her. And he definitely feels some type of way towards Agatha for um, killing Alice and not stopping sort of that power transfer from happening any sooner. And the moment that he actually gets the balls to kind of stand up to Agatha and really push back against what she's doing, this is where sort of the revelations sort of start hitting the fan for him. Um, you know, she... The reference to him about you're just like your mother, right? Like there's a level of teen here. I don't want to say he's too good to be a witch, but I think his understanding of what it means to be a witch, the self selfishness that certainly comes from it, right? I mean, despite what happened with Alice, you even get the other coven members who while feeling terrible for the loss of Alice, kind of understands that that's what comes with being on the witch's road. You know, that they're all kind of in it for themselves at the end of the day. Like they just need to worry about themselves kind of getting to the end to acquire the power or what it is that they certainly want for themselves. Uh, and the realization for that, I think really shakes teen. I think teen is looking for more of a team 
somebody, some camaraderie, people to look out for each other. And he's realizing the selfishness that comes with being a witch. And so for him to be able to kind of stand up and I look even even looking at the teen character, there's a heroic posture to him. He stands up a little bit straighter. His chin is a little bit higher up like he's defending uh, somebody sort of thing. And I love the fact that Agatha kind of calls him out for it, you know, um, almost in a sense of like, why are you looking down on us witches when you want to be a witch yourself, right? But now that you see what it takes, now maybe you're you're t you're too good for it. Or you feel like you're you've got the moral ground here, right? And so when she says things like, "You remind me of of your mother." Um, that's exactly probably the same mentality that maybe Scarlet Witch had, or at least that Agatha believes that Wanda certainly had also. And so it definitely is going to make for an interesting dynamic. And then just hearing that we get to see Wiccan, or I should say teen, AKA Billy Maximoff activating his powers, um, controlling the other coven, um, him thrusting the rest of the coven into sort of like this muddy quicksand, uh, and so, you know, killing them, if you will. I'm sure he probably hasn't killed them off, but the fact that we get to see Billy Maximoff not only activating his powers, he also has like this Scarlet Witch esque sort of crown that he kind of wears, um, very, very, um, very close to like the the Wiccan uh, costume, if you will, from uh, the comic books and things like that. So very reminiscent of that of what the Scarlet Witch was certainly wearing. So like mother like son uh and i find it really compelling so i hope that they explore more like how was billy alive last time we saw scarlet witch was trying to get her children back through different multiverses is he a multiverse version of billy where somewhere else you know her kids have grown up to live a healthy and and and, and enjoyable life like i am kind of curious as to where this version of billy maximoff comes from concerning the fact that they really were just creations uh, out of magic from from wanda so will wanda show up in here will we have a cameo will we get a backstory and origin story for billy and how he He's actually here. Uh, I definitely hope so. We got a couple more episodes left, so we'll see how the rest of the season certainly turns out. But um, I was a big fan of it. The hilarious impersonation from Katherine Hahn to play, was it Deborah Roof, who played um, uh, Sharon in here? Uh, the fact that I honestly thought she was possessed by Mrs. Hart's ghost, uh, only to come to find out that it was just Katherine Hahn as Agatha doing a, a, a funny impression. And then learning a little bit more about the Salem Seven. You know, when they first introduced the Salem Seven, I did not truly care about um their reveal in their debut like i was hoping for more comic book accurate level salem sevens but we didn't get that in here but what i do find it fascinating is that we have a bunch of animals in this episode like we see a snake a fox a crow an owl and a bee and bees and almost seems to sort of represent the seven which you know i i'm kind of hoping more for like um you know heavy makeup prosthetics costumes and things like that for the salem seven to be more comic book accurate but it seems as though they're kind of maybe taking their the characters animal influences showcasing the actual animals in this instance in this particular episode to represent some of the secret seven so it's kind of like hey these are the secret seven from the comics but we didn't quite have the budget or the makeup work to go ahead with it but we want you to know that we know how accurate we can possibly you know that we're trying to still be accurate with who the salem seven certainly is but what i found even more interesting is that we have seen the salem seven well technically we haven't seen the salem seven before but the previous flashback from wandavision for agatha was the parents to the salem seven so Agatha's previous coven that she traveled the witches road with was that that group of coven of witches that she absorbed the powers from that we saw from WandaVision and the fact that it kind of all comes full circle that the Salem seven are now parentless because of this woman talk about wanting to exact revenge on somebody and come after Agatha so it definitely makes sense as to why they're certainly hunting her down so enjoyable episode um really eye-opening in the sense of Agatha 
Agatha's past with her mother along with her son, the big reveal here of Teen being Billy Maximoff and tapping into his abilities, showcasing that he's a lot stronger than I think he's really been letting on, or maybe he didn't even know he was truly capable of doing what he was certainly doing, uh, but it definitely opens up a lot of questions and hopefully a lot of answers as we go towards the second half of this season. But overall, man, I certainly enjoyed it. My biggest gripe is you know, these less than 30 minute episodes just ain't doing it for me sometimes, man. So hopefully that's not going to be the case going forward. But look, at the end of the day, I want to know your thoughts. What did you guys think about episode five of Agatha all along? Let your thoughts be known in the comment section box below. Um, and uh, we'll certainly talk on next week's episode. But until then, do me a big favor. As always, guys, take care of yourselves, take care of each other and keep it A+. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.